Maestro. Hi, <laughs> 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 a newborn. I must say, I do miss uh, 75 or 80 people calling Maestro at the <laughs> recording session, even though I know it's hokum. <laughs> Well, can I call you Uncle Ira then, or Professor oh, Ira? Yes, uh, yes, that's another thing I've been called. <laughs> Two questions, first of all, from a, a viewer of mine, Dr. Impossible, who loves soundtracks, and especially the ones you've done. So the first don't, one is... Wait, 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 wait. Don't talk too fast, because, you know, I only speak English. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so, first question is... Outside of film composing, did you ever consider putting your vast musical talents toward creating an orchestral symphony or works that reflects your musical voice with orchestra as a standalone entity? Yes, I did, but luckily I took a break. I breathed deeply. I lay down for a while until it passed. A second question. <laughs> what has been the most challenging and personal film score it's to write for a film or television that meant a great deal to you? Comedies, a lot, most comedies don't really have continuity and uh, a real storyline. And so you end up writing individual chunks of music in comedies, you, you know, to make the jokes funnier. So, uh, I, I'm stereotyped in comedy, so I couldn't get one of those. You know, it didn't matter, too. I mean, they they don't care. You know, if you, uh, you can't do a big dramatic thing until somebody hires you, and they won't hire you until you already did one. I noticed about your soundtracks, because of the, some of them are parody films, you'd get to do horror, suspense, and uh, all sorts of other different themes going throughout the film. Yes, and that is fun and enjoyable, and you can learn a lot of things, but it's not, it only goes so far. Mm. I mean, I didn't want to have a career sounding like uh, six different types of comedy and 42 different types of semi-comedy, but you get what you get. Uh, I mean, because if you ask me about Hollywood, I'm going to tell you, but uh, there, it's not a nice place. It's not a place where you're mostly dealing with decent people who are creative and interested, blah, blah, blah. It's a money grubbing place. Is that uh, why you stopped composing in the like late 90s? Uh, yes. I'm it's also, it's also, if you make a few enemies, they'll tell everybody that you suck. <laughs> and they'll believe them if they're the kind of people. I mean, I don't want to get into it too much because it makes me feel terrible, but there's a lot of backstabbing and stuff like that. And you can never tell who's doing what to whom or why. But, yeah, I mean, I'm a musician, right? and I was a musician, I mean, I, I sang on the radio with my mother when I was three, and, and so, I mean, I've always been an entertainer, you know, uh, a musician, pretty much, I like all of it, I like entertaining people, I, I, entertaining myself, too. Hmm. Um, it's a difficult profession. I'm because most of the time you never really see or feel what the artists are going through. They just say, oh, look at them. They make millions of dollars. It's so beautiful. <laughs> and unless somebody digs up the fact that they murdered their mother, you won't hear about it. Because you've also done some acting in films with uh, Junior, Zanadu, uh, Amazon Women on the Moon. Yeah. That was all because of people I knew who were friends of mine. And so they said, hey, he'll be great at this. Let's let him do it. They weren't exactly uh, big parts. But since I acted when I was a kid, uh, I was happy to do it just to do something different. 
I was just interested in artistic endeavors and also eating. <laughs> e- eating is very important. So, yeah. Uh, what instruments do you play then? Most, because I was a studio guitar player first. So, okay. uh, you know, anything that was something like a guitar, I played it. What else? I think that's, and, you know, a little harmonica. I, I played a trombone and trumpet uh, earlier and flute. Was it easy to jump from one to another, or did you have to spend a lot of time practicing and getting ha- the hang of it? Well, I mean, you have to, you have to practice, you know. I mean, <laughs> people who tell you that they just picked it up and it was great, a lie. <laughs> we may be talented, but, you know, they're, they're lying. Um, no, I did. I had to learn what I had to learn. I mean, uh, I wasn't a virtuoso on anything but the guitar. Uh, so you've written did, two songs uh, that one was performed by B.B. Uh, by B. B. King and in, Into the Night soundtrack. Yeah, that uh, the B side is, uh, is uh, what was it? My Lucille. Mm. Those two came out very well. He's, he's a gentleman and a wonderful person. Oh. A big talent. So that you know, I, if you're gonna ask me, like you say, like, was it some movie that I did and it came out great, I can't really say that, but I can tell you a whole bunch of songs and cues and things that I did that I was proud of. He wrote it and he played it. <laughs> yeah, but I'll tell you something. He's an example of a real talent. He when he's started singing or playing the guitar part, it was like, holy mackerel. I mean, there are people who are so talented like that, that they just do whatever they do, and all of a sudden, it's 200% better. And he was, he's one of them. Nice. And other people I worked with, like Aretha Franklin Mm -hmm. in Blues Brothers, another monster, we call them. Because it's like they're just beyond, they're just beyond. They're so talented and so amazing and so instinctive, instinctual. It's incredible. She blew me away. He blew me away. Uh, what's his name? Ray Charles. Yeah. Another one also in the blues. Brothers. He's a monster. He's so talented. It was incredible. It was like, I mean, I don't walk around saying, oh, it's an honor and a pleasure to play with somebody, but with them, it was an honor and a pleasure. <laughs> but, but it, it, uh, he, that was not such a big, I mean, I liked Gab Galloway when I heard his early records, like Hey Joe and uh, whatever else he did, but he was kind of a cranky guy. Because uh, but, I think the story on Blues Brothers, when Aretha was they're trying to film Marita with a, uh, playing back her track, but she wouldn't, she couldn't do the same song every time. She couldn't, she did it different well, every time. Yeah. Yeah. It's because she's Aretha Franklin. You changed the film. Don't tell her to change the scene. What are you doing? <laughs> but she managed to get it done. But I'm telling you, when we did think, I mean, I can tell you, I have so many stories like this. Uh, first, I, I called her up when we were beginning to do it. And I said, boy, you know, we all can't wait to see you. You know, everybody here, everybody in the band is dying to see you. And she says, well, baby, you know, I, I'm not 17 anymore. I said, 17? <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to say? You're not 17 anymore. You're a freaking amazing person. And she came out, and uh, so we were trying to begin the tune, and she she was playing. She she has like what do you call like talons? Her her uh, her fingernails. It's like on a hawk or an eagle. It's so long, and right. she sat down, she sat down and she started playing the piano part. I'm thinking, how the hell can you play the piano? Anna with those nails, but she didn't. She just had her hands flattened like this. They were like 
this like that. Mm-hmm. Mm. I actually played. It was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. How talented she was. Not just no. singing. A piano player. And it was amazing. And finally, you know, we started all right, let's take a, the take. We did two takes, and then she slammed the, co- the cover down on the ground and said, that's it. <laughs> and, oh, that's it. But, and, yes, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Please don't <laughs> It, it was amazing. James Brown was in it as well. Yeah, well, I knew him. I, I think I also did another movie after him. He's another one. He's from Mars. You can't believe what he could do and what he would say. He became a best friend. Oh, cool. I mean, strange things that you would never guess. I'm sitting in his hotel room with him. And uh, after, you know, we were talking for a while, I had spoken to him before, and he says, uh, Ira, yeah, uh, I gotta ask you something. Said, oh, okay. And he pulls his chair over closer to me. I gotta ask you something. I said, what? He says, is the Shah Jewish? <laughs> the shot of a man, right? I, I'm supposed to know this because I'm Jewish. Like, we all talk to each other. <laughs> so, uh, I'm thinking, um, uh, I, I don't know him, and nobody ever told me he was Jewish, but he figured that since I'm Jewish and we all talk to each other, <laughs> we, I mean, it's like, what planet am I on? <laughs> But he was he was great too. He taught me a lot of interesting stuff, and he's James Brown. This that's it, man. He's James Brown. <laughs> but you've also worked with uh, Diana Ross, Billy Joel, Pointer Sisters before doing scores. Yep, um, the tunes. I mean, Billy, I know since we were fourteen. Okay. I, I did a record with, what's her name, Diana Ross. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, that was all pretty good. I mean, uh, nobody was too hard. Bet Midler. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that all worked out. Doing records could be terrible, but it wasn't. It was fun. I like that. The best, if you're working on one tune at a time and trying to perfect it, which is a lot more interesting to a musician than, all right, hurry up, get it done. Come on, we got to get on to the next piece. Uh, well, I was looking at the um, Ace Ventura soundtrack. It's very rock. Are you a rock person? I am. I mean, I'm everything you can think of mm. with uh, varying levels of uh, love or expertise at some of them. Some of them I don't care about it, oh, but I work hard to do it right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Spintura was a rock and roll. I mean, I did it with, uh, you know, a bunch of synthesizers, a couple of guitars, a couple of saxophones, and I actually had a good time doing it. It was fun. Mm. Because it's one of those things where nobody was annoying me too much. Because, uh, like, with Ferris Bueller's Day Off, that's a lot of different things. you got synth, and you got James Bond style, and some jazz, and all sorts in there. Yeah. Well, that's John Hughes. John Hughes what is a, was a very intelligent guy. little uh, manipulative, <laughs> and, uh, but he was very talented, very smart. So I, he, he was, like, the main guy who... I had to write 92 different styles of music. I tried to make, try to play beat the temp. I had to beat the temporary track and get better than what was there, which was kind of a challenge. Right. So that was okay. But then there's a, a sort of semi-James Bond theme as well in a little bit of it. But That's just me. I figured, I mean, it's, it's like three bars, you know, so you got to <laughs> nail it. You don't have like 20 minutes to, for them to say, oh, yeah, that's James Bond, isn't it? <laughs> no, you got to go, boom, yeah, boom. <laughs> but what's fun about that was you have to fit it in between 
the words that he's saying. So it's got to, you want to make it sound musical, and at the same time, you want it to underline what he's saying. So that was actually kind of fun, that little bit. Yeah, it looks like it. Because uh, I was going to say, because with uh, planes, trains, and automobiles, just because like, the whole film is like everything is a different theme. I didn't realize it until I watched it properly with studying the music this time that they very rarely have the same theme anywhere in the, throughout the whole film. Which is exactly what I was trying to tell you before. Mm-hmm. That's what I got stuck doing because I can write a lot of different kinds of music and I have a very good sense of where to put it and make it seem musical. And that's what I ended up doing. It's sort of like being maybe a seamstress who can't make a dress, but you can sew up the fly in the pants and put a button on and sew that up. And you think, wow, you great job sewing those buttons on. Yeah, but I don't care. I must say there was some stuff in that that really also came out very good when they're on the train and it stalls and then they have mm. to walk across the field. And I, you know, I, I made it sound like an old country blues tune with harmonica and everything else. Stuff that's, but it wasn't like I put a chunk of a song in. I wrote it like scoring. Hmm. I mean, you know, there's a difference. Like a lot of times nowadays, the, a lot of the composers, let's just say they're not very good. And they, they, they don't care about the old thing of how you write scoring that fits in with the movie and, and, and supports it, but still sounds good, hmm. which I thought it was a great thing to do, and I was always happy to do that. But now they, they take a, a chunk of music and they shove it in, and it works, right? Because you get a mood. But just trying to get a mood is not, uh, uh, you know, anything exciting to me. Well, yeah, it's like uh, speaking about the John's uh, themes. You don't get themes like hero themes anymore that you know instantly. It's like Indiana Jones or yep. Star Wars. You don't get anything that you can instantly say that's from there. You got it. That's the truth. But that's the thing that we all like because mm. once you get a good theme, you don't have to rack your brains for every single scene. You use the theme. You play it fast, you play it slow, you change the instrumentation, and everybody knows it's the music from that movie. Mm. And that's what I was really interested in doing instead of just, uh, you know, what, what I was doing. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I've got my Dragnet album here. Ah, yes, I see. <laughs> uh, yeah, so side two is your score, and then side one is the songs. Because you have to use some of the um, the Dragnet old theme tune in some of it, didn't you? Well, I had to. Hmm. I mean, there's only one theme. <laughs> Which I always like. Everybody liked that. Everybody liked it. And I was I used to watch it on television. I wrote, I wrote a couple of tunes, but... Hmm. Um, uh, forgive me for telling you the truth everything, but uh, sometimes movies have problems mm. and it doesn't go along smoothly and professionally. Right. The, the director who was like the uh, scion of a famous showbiz family he was having a lot of trouble emotional troubles with the movie because of the pressure. Which okay. is, it's, that's, that can be really terrible. And so we were doing things and then we couldn't do anything because he didn't know if he liked anything. And uh-huh. he said, wait a minute, we got, we got to, we, we have to get this done. <laughs> you can't just say, I'm, think about it. You can't think about it either. Neither can we. We got to get this done. So that was, a bit of a problem, so I, it was just a, a tough, a tough thing. 
Yeah, because I think it was his first time directing, wasn't it? He was motive yes. writer. Yes, he was like he's from a famous family, mm. a showbiz family, <laughs> but he was not ready for this. He was sitting and trying to write music for like a ninety-something piece orchestra, and he can't decide whether he likes it or not. So what do you want That's me to right. do? Leave it now? I've got five minutes to write it. <laughs> There's like no reality. Yeah, I guess yes or no is better than I don't know. <laughs> yes, yes, you can go one way or the other. Uh, one of your themes that gets in my ear that doesn't go is innocent blood. I think that's the gangster's theme. Yes, that's it. That's it. <laughs> he has to drive away his expensive car. I have fun with that too. <laughs> it sounds like it's like going to clever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, I, I mean, I enjoy being successful at something. So that was good. That, that was fun. There was some good stuff in that movie. Because you also did, I guess, My Blue Heaven, which is a bit gangster as well. Yeah, yeah. It was, it, uh, what's his name? Steve. Uh, Steve Martin, yes. And also... Uh, Rick Moranis. Yes, Rick Moranis, another great person. And Steve is pretty great, too. Oh, nice. That doesn't sound like me trying to tell you how these people are all nice and talented. <laughs> but but they, they were great. And John Candy, that was playing Strange and Automobiles. He was yeah. great. When did you meet up with them? At different times. You know, they asked me to come down and uh, talk to them because, I mean, I knew John Candy from doing the theme to... Uh, SC... Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I had to go up there and meet them all so that they knew that I was an actual human being. <laughs> and they were all great, too. They were funny as hell. And that's where I met Candy, so... You know, you sort of run into these people multiple times, and they're friendly and nice. I, I, I don't think, I can't remember running into an actor or something who wasn't nice. That's good to hear. It's just yeah. the producers and directors, is it? Uh, yes, since you mentioned it. Mm. Well, and the pressure they're under, mm. you can sort of understand it because... They're the producer and the director. If the movie sucks, it's because they did it. So they get yeah. very, very upset. <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether it really does stink. It might be good, but they think it stinks, and, and yeah. they get crazy. Your first film composed is All Night Long with Gene Hackman, Dennis Quaid, and Barbara Streisand. Yes. That was interesting because... Uh, I don't. Re I think that was the first movie I did. But, you know, I had been working in the studio as a guitarist and everything. And uh, but that was another weird one because the woman who was the director was Sue Bangers, but no, no, it was her husband who was the uh, the director, Jean Claude Tremont. Oh right. Yeah, and she was the biggest agent in Hollywood. So you got trouble now because they have all these big people who know better than anyone in the universe. <laughs> so so uh, they wanted, it was, it was like the famous problem of Hollywood. The studio wanted the music to be more modern and trendy and rockish. Right. But the director, who is French, he wants it to be the music from a Charlie Chaplin movie. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and I was saying, hey, I'll do whatever you want. Just make up your mind. <laughs> and uh, so I had to listen to the studio because they told him, you better shut up and let him do it because he's a big rock and roll guy. <laughs> So I did it, and I sort of got in the middle, because, you know, there's certain rhythms, like a two-beat rhythm, boom, 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 boom. It's like, uh, like an old uh, 
When I get older, I'm losing my hair. That's mm. the thing. It was the Beatles. Right? So, yeah. nothing wrong with it. so I tried to make it a combination of all of that stuff. And I did a good job. But uh, he hated it. Oh. <laughs> and it was not fun. <laughs> <laughs> but but I got some good music. Out of it. God, good. So at least I can... Uh, uh, in my dotage, dotage, uh, listen to some of these cues and say, hmm, not bad. At <laughs> least something. You don't want people going, ah, turn it off. <laughs> uh, I never had that happen. One of your most famous pieces, the police squad theme. Da, oh, da, yeah. Da, da, da. <laughs> and that, that is a story behind that too. We were doing this, and then they, they fessed, fessed up and told me this is a parody of Lee Marvin as the cop. 1950s cop show. Right. And they, the first episode of it was a shot-by-shot shot parody of the thing. Right. Said, and we want you to take that theme and... We write it so that uh, I said, look, if I make it sound too much like it, we'll get sued for plagiarism. You can't do this. That's what I'm saying. They don't know what they're talking about. So I said, look, I'm happy to make something like it, something that's exciting and fun and everything, but I can't do it too close. We'll get in trouble. And I mean, Paramount will screw you to the wall, too. So, uh, but it's like talking to a Martian. They don't get it. So I wrote it and Paramount, <laughs> the music supervisor said, you can't do this. What are you kidding? It's plagiarism. <laughs> I said, okay. So I told them we can't do it. It's too close. Cause they were telling me, get it closer, get it closer. So. Oh. Uh, I backed off a little, and still the same thing happened. It's too close. You can't do this. It's plagiarism. So finally, I think the third time I rewrote it, and they liked it, and the head of music said, this is good. <laughs> but but you, wanna, you can talk about having a heart attack, writing the same thing three times. <laughs> And, and you can't, pl I say, you can't do this. Don't you understand? <laughs> but uh, that came out good. So the theme came out good, and it's pretty famous. Yeah, it's very famous now, isn't it? That's uh, what the TV series. There was the three films, and people still know it from uh, parodying it themselves. Yeah, yeah. Naked Gun, which is the movies. Yeah, but, and I even like it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Is there a piece of your work that you don't like? Yeah, but nothing big. Yeah. Just little stupid things that I had to write in five minutes. And I don't yeah. Yeah. yeah, stuff that you uh, didn't feel was finished, is it? Yeah. No, because if I had to write something, I would never... <laughs> <laughs> Will it be so that I hated it because it was incompetent? Or mm -hmm. Never, I was. I'm not doing it. That's it. Yeah, it's just an episode of Tales of the Crypt. Yeah, that was interesting. Mm. Uh, because what was happening was, I don't remember whoever was producing it started calling up all his uh, director friends. And snoring them into doing an episode. <laughs> and so they called up the composers they're hiring and to snore them into doing an, an episode. Sonia Braga, of course, yeah, and Dylan McDermott. Yes. Yeah. I they both did a great job. Mm. So I, the thing I did, you know what they paid us? Five thousand dollars. <laughs> okay. Thousand dollars to write all the music to an episode, which means I don't know how long it was. It seemed like a week or two, but it was really only <clears throat> 28 minutes, I think it says here. So, yeah. 
But the point, the point is that uh, I, I gave all the money to the guy with the synthesizer studio, just to get it done. So I yeah. did nothing. But oh. it came up easily. I mean, there was something that I did, I was proud of too. Because how is a composer? You have to. The, does the film studio pay you? And then you have to pay all the orchestra and all the people no, that you. No, that came in later. <laughs> all right. <laughs> when they figured out that they can screw you even more, <laughs> right. you, you, you have your agent who's busy trying to figure out how to do something to you, and he makes you tell them how much you want, and. He makes the deal with the head of the music department of the studio. Right. And they pay you, and they do everything else. They pay for the musicians, they pay for the engineers, everything. And you just write the music and conduct it. Okay. That's then. But then when they discovered what else they could do, they're trying to make deals, package deals, where, like, they say, we'll give you $100,000. You have to pay for the musicians. You have to pay for the studio. You have to pay for this. And the other thing, I, I refuse, flatly refuse to ever do any of them. Yeah. So they were doing it with young composers who didn't realize <clears throat> what they're trying to do to you. So I just didn't do it. That, that's part of what got me out of the business. Mm. It becoming too much of a business. Right. Because, yeah, you, you co-wrote, I guess I'm just screwed for Naked Gun 2, so uh, <laughs> that's not quite apt. Apt. <laughs> and apt. My apt song. <laughs> you don't really think that whoever wrote that with me really wrote it, do you? <laughs> The director. Yeah, I had a great title though. Because you got the the band Ira and the Geeks. Yes, I couldn't resist. Whenever <laughs> I had to do a source cue, and it was long enough to be something you could listen to. Right. I decided to call it Ira and the Geeks <laughs> because actually the people. I were using the things like friends of mine, and they were yeah. nutty too. So we had a great time doing it. <laughs> yeah, because you've done a, a few songs with the geeks. Yep. Don't ask me to remember them. <laughs> I got Geek Boogie for 16 Candles. Yeah, that's the first time I did it. <laughs> and uh, was it Weird Romance for Weird Science? Yes. <laughs> But I'll tell you one of the great things that happened. You know, what's the name of the actress in uh, Weird Science? Oh, Kelly LeBrock. Kelly LeBrock. You ever see what she looks like? <laughs> in that film, yes. <laughs> I, they wanted me to come down and say hi. So I came down and I was walking to the back of the, what do you call it, the sound stage. And there on a High chair, studio, you know, like a high stool hmm. is this unbelievable, mind blowing woman <laughs> in white lingerie <laughs> with bee stung lips. And I was saying, I don't believe this. <laughs> I went over and again, I was, uh, I, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Ira Newborn, the composer. I promise I will write the best music I can to make you look even more incredible than you do already. Of course, I was joking, but, <laughs> but I meant it to. That was, I remember that. I see it in my mind. You're a lucky man. Uh, <laughs> right. I just got, uh, one more film to ask about. Uh, Mole Rats. Hi. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right. Oh, why? There's a story behind that one, too. <laughs> but the, the guy who wrote it, Smith. Kevin Smith, yeah. Kevin Smith. He had never really done anything. So it's another one that he's trying to uh, 
<laughs> you like the music for a guy who's like half Turkish, half Puerto Rican, uh, a haberdasher who decided to be a director. <laughs> and so I did his movie. And it was like, not my not my cup of poison. Mm. Uh, at the end of the movie, when we were doing the last thing, <laughs> can, <laughs> can I put this? Uh, <laughs> he wanted the saxophone player. He's getting creative, you know what I mean? After a whole long time of being intimidated by all of these great musicians and big music, he, he wanted to have the saxophone player play something that he thought he was telling him how to play. <laughs> and he was, oh man, I, I gotta get out of here, you know what I mean? This, like the whole band is here, we can't keep fooling around because he wants to go, go bloop, 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 or whatever, whatever it is, you know, he said, and I'm trying to say, this isn't a high school play. This is <laughs> Hollywood. They spend, it costs 25,000 bucks for this band for like, so, so he, I probably made a face. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was it. He hated me forever. All oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Because I even wrote something on the internet, which you could find. It oh. says what a horrible person I was for taking the enjoyment and fun out of his <laughs> first movie by smacking him. And <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, I love that. Is there anything new, modern movie, music that you listen to? Not really. I mean, yeah. I've heard of you. Television shows with the composers okay. are pretty good. Okay. And I actually liked it, which is a rare thing. But I, a couple of shows, can't remember the names, of them, but they were the music was good, interesting, and even you know, synths stuff like. Mm -hmm. Which I don't like that much, but they managed to do a good job and had feeling. It, mm. If it doesn't have feeling, I'm not interested. But this stuff had feeling, so I liked it. But oh, that's about all I can think of. Some TV shows. I don't even go to the movies anymore. No, nor do I. It's a sad times. Yeah. I mean, I miss it. Be from the days when I was like sitting in some theater on Hollywood Boulevard watching the what's it called uh, Spielberg movie uh, Close Encounters. All right, yeah. And I was up in the nosebleed section. I mean, those those uh, movie places are enormous from the thirties, and I was all the way up just under the projector. All right, and, and I had a great time. It was interesting, it was fun, it was a real experience. Now, you can't even get uh, to see a movie in a, in a, uh, in a, on a screen that big. Yeah, they all fit smaller in. Yeah, that I miss movies on a big screen, that real great movie experience. And the only place I... Got to see it was in the studio because they got big screens in the studio <laughs> and that was a charge. Ah, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I feel the same way because <laughs> I'm the last film I enjoyed. I think in the cinema was Die Hard when they rescreened it last Christmas. Yeah, I saw it, <laughs> and maybe the last one I saw too. In the theater. <laughs> yeah, that was good. But I saw it in the big screen too. Exactly. Uh, mine wasn't too big, but yeah, unfortunately. But yeah, it was. There's nothing else that's tempted me out much. Well, you see, we're just too, too <laughs> tired of <old laughs> movie guys. I even I when I went to the movies in the end of the fifties and watched these movies called The Mysterians. 
and I married a monster from outer space. I enjoyed them. The horse soldiers with William Holden. That's when it was really exciting. The movies. Yeah. God bless him. <laughs> well, at least we still have them. <laughs> well, yeah, I bought a lot of them. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid. <laughs> What's his name? The Italian director. Federico Fellini. Oh, yes. He was in Amacord and uh, Giulietta degli Spiritu. Giulietta of the Spirits. Magic. Real yeah. magic. Yeah, so I got my props. <laughs> my 80s films of yours. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I have them too in a box. <laughs> <laughs> On VHS or DVD? VHS. Oh, a couple of <laughs> I wouldn't say, no, they're not like wax cylinders. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that uh, wraps it up for me. Uh, I'm just going to wish you a happy birthday for next month. Yeah, I'm 75. <laughs> nice not, you, I mean. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm not too far behind. I'm 52. So. <laughs> but, yes, there we go. So thanks for doing this for me. It's been an honor to speak to you. I'm staying here. It's a pleasure to talk to somebody who knows about movies and music and the rare occurrence. Take care. Enjoy your uh, lamb curry. <laughs> I will as soon as the burn seal off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's great. So uh, thank you. All right, enjoy the rest of your day and thanks again. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> bye bye. <Okay. laughs>